you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of open your eyes. Open your eyes. Uh, sometimes on Sunday mornings, I need to preach this message uh, because some folks pray for me throughout the service. <laughs> I'm just kidding, they don't. I haven't caught anybody lately. Let me give you the outline. (laughs) Number one, number one, the opposition. The opposition. I'm telling you, folks, if you live for Christ, you're going to have opposition. There's going to be people that don't like you. There's going to be people that want to make your life tougher. Okay, so there's going to be opposition. Number two, the odds. You know what I like about odds? They mean absolutely nothing to God. They mean nothing to God. All right? My Bible says, with God, all things are possible. The third thing is the opening of eyes, the opening of eyes. And personally, folks, I cannot imagine being blind, okay? I cannot imagine living my life uh, that way. Uh, Everything that we do in life uh, has to do with our sense of vision. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out uh, to the blind, And I know they've come a long ways in surgeries and special glasses and all of that, uh, but it is. It is a physical, huge challenge to be blind. But there's also a blindness that we don't think about a lot of times. And folks, it's a spiritual blindness, okay? And again, you cannot compare the two. They're two totally different things. Uh, But spiritual blindness will hurt you in two ways. One... You could be lost. You, you just don't know Christ, all right? And that, that's the worst thing at all. Not to know Christ is the worst thing at all, okay? And the second thing is even as Christians, sometimes we have blind spots, okay? Things that, you know, uh, we probably should know or things that we know we should do, all right? But, you know, a lot of times we're not sensitive to the Spirit in those areas. So with that in mind, I want to... You know, look at Second Kings chapter six, verse eight. And in our text, a point to remember is that there is a difference between Elijah and Elisha. Okay, I, a lot of times when folks are uh, teaching or or you know they're studying this, they get those two mixed up. And I think sometimes it's because they're so, so close together in the Bible, in 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 familiarity. But Elijah. Jay is one of the most famous of all the Old Testament prophets because of the many miracles that God had done through him. And uh, we know the huge one in Kings uh, was, first Kings, uh, was the prophets of Baal. And you talk about odds, it was 650 to 1. Okay? And by the way, uh, who won that deal, all right? <laughs> the prophet in God won that one, all right? Elijah, Elisha, in also was a quiet farm boy, all right, that was not as well known uh, by people, but God used him, uh, to, used him to help conquer the pagan enemies that were attacking Israel. And this is our part of our text here. Elisha was like that still small voice that obeyed God and trusted in God's power and in God's wisdom. The point, the point, uh, and, and the difference between the two prophets is that not everybody seems cut out for the big stage. Okay, we think of Elijah and we think, wow, what a guy. But I'm telling you, just looking at uh, the scripture that we are looking at, uh, he, he, with God's help, uh, defeated, defeated uh, uh, the Syrians. All right? Um, I think of Gideon is another one. Okay, he was a farm boy. All right, and he... God chose him, and I mean, he just said, basically, you know, who am I? Okay, who am I? Who am I? I, I am nothing. I, I, I'm not a warrior. I'm not a soldier. Uh, but God used him. Uh, I think of Moses uh, when he came back, you know, and God, God was just saying, you're my spokesman, and Moses was giving excuses. Uh, I can't talk. All right, nobody's going to listen to me. Uh, so the point is, uh, when God is in it, he can use us mightily. All right, let's look at the opposition in 2 Kings 6. Verse 8, now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And we know that pretty much happened 
a lot. They were neighbors. Uh, they were different. You know, Syrians uh, were, were just, you know, kind of mean-hearted people. They uh, worshipped Baal, all right? Baal was a foreign god, and uh, they, they were just pr- pretty much a pagan society and did not like Israel. And he consulted with his servant, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place, uh, and the man of God, in, in the man of such and such a place, and the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not uh, pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down here. I think uh, one thing that stood out, in, and I've read this passage many, many times, was that the, the prophet of God knew what the Syrian king was doing. But Baal, who they worshipped, I mean, he obviously couldn't do anything, all right? I mean, it's, it, it's a false god. It's, a, it's an idol, all right? Where our God, big G, Jehovah God of this Bible, spoke to the prophet, and it was almost as if, uh, you know, Elisha was in his war room knowing what was going on, all right? Verse 10, then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So at least three times this happened. The Syrians were going to attack at a certain place, but I'm telling you, the prophet Elisha told uh, the army of Israel where they were going to be and thwarted that. Now verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And folks, That's the difference between a true God, our God, and the Syrian God. All right? Psalm 139. Just turn there real quick with me. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Let's look in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my, my rising up. Folks, God knows everything about us. Uh, Uh, You understand my thought afar off. Not only does he know where we're at, not only does he know every part, the hairs on our heads, he can read our minds. All right? So stealing the enemies, uh, you know, and again, it's not even stealing. He, He knew. He's God. He watches everything that is going on. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And God's there, all right? He's omnipresence. He can be everywhere at one time. So God just had to listen in on the conversation, and then he relayed that to Elijah. You have hedged behind me and before me and laid your hands upon me. That's that anointing, okay? That's that, uh, that prophecy. That's that gift that God gave Elijah and Elisha. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain it. Same thing with Daniel and the interpretation of dreams. Folks, it was God. God used these men, all right, uh, for his will and for his purpose. Now it says, verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled of this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel. And he logically thinking, you know, again, not spiritually thinking, just thinking war-wise or strategy-wise, there is somebody in our room and they are selling these. They are they are selling us out and telling them what is going on. In verse 12, and one of his servants said, "None, my lord." And by the way, uh, that servant was Ben uh Hadad. Ben Hadad was one that reported that But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So, I mean, my question is, how did he know that? Okay, how did he know that? Well, obviously, the word got around. Uh, Somebody told them what was going on. Then verse 13, so he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send him and get him. And by the way, get him. I don't think it was one of these things, we'll put him in jail type things, all right? I believe he was going to put an end to Elijah. 
because he'd already lost several troops. You know, there, there was casualties, uh, you know, according to the word of God. And he said, uh, go and see where he is that I may send him and get him. And it was told of him, surely he is in Dolphin. So Psalm 37, look at Psalm 37 with me. Psalm 37. The Bible says, do not fret because of evildoers. Folks, I'm telling you, you should, fret means worry. And matter of fact, three times in this chapter it tells us, uh, Psalm 37, not to worry. Okay, because there are times it appears that Christians are being defeated. There are times that it appears, even in our text, okay, that, that uh, they're going to win out. Okay, but we should not fret of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And folks, I am just telling you, if not in this life, okay, because I, I know, especially when I was in the youth ministry, you know, I'd have a youth say, well, what about these drug dealers? Man, they're driving the new cars. They got the gold around their necks. They're doing all this. And I said, here and now. Okay, but they've got, to, they've got to face a holy God. Everyone is going to face the judgment of God. So don't worry about evil. They're going to get caught. You run drugs long enough, folks, you're going to get caught. All right, so don't worry about that stuff. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. This is our job, okay? Even though it seems like the world is beating us down, don't worry about it. Let me just say this phrase, God has got this. He's got it. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. All right? Listen, folks. Lamentations says our God is faithful. Okay? He's faithful. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way into the Lord and trust him also, even when it doesn't seem like you're winning. Folks, I am telling you, I've read the rest of the book. I've read the end of Revelation, and we win. We win. And he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as noonday. So we see the opposition. And folks, the, the Syrians, in many of the battles that you've seen, uh, you know, they defeated the Israelites. But a lot of that was because they were, the Israelites were not wholly following the Lord. But just because you're Christian, I want to say this, doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. Doesn't mean you're not going to have enemies or challenging things in your life or even be attacked by other Christians. That doesn't mean that. It simply means don't worry about it. God's going to take care of you. In the end, you are going to be okay. So we see the opposition. Now look at these odds. Man, this is crazy. Look at verse 14. Therefore he sent horses and chariots in a great army there. All right? To Dothan. You would think, trying to find one guy, Elijah, and his servant, okay, we'll take 12 guys. I mean, you would think 12 guys can capture Elijah. But he was not taking a chance. All right? He was not taking a chance. He sent a whole army after Elijah. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Why by night? The surprise. Hey, I got news for you folks. God sees in the dark. Okay, I don't care. I don't care where you go. I don't care how isolated you think things are. He watches everything you do. Folks, I think sometimes we don't think about that. You know when a kid's doing wrong? I mean, if you, you walk in and a, and a kid has his back to you, all right, and then he, you know, he, he's doing something and you're not seeing him, and they go like this and look at that doorway and go like that and look at that doorway. What are they doing? They're seeing if somebody is watching them. Okay, folks, I got news for you. God can see through walls. God can see everything, everything. Verse 15, and when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, and again, it says 
you know, this, this was a new servant. It was a young servant, according to biblical history. But he had a good thing working for him. He arose early. Folks, I do believe the saying, the early bird gets the worm. All right, don't put things off that need to be done. Don't put things off. Even, uh, un, you know, even you know, situations that, are, that you're not comfortable with. Folks, get her done. Get it done. Face up to it. All right? Face that giant. And went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. Now, folks, you don't have to be a war strategist to figure out, man, this is not good. Okay? Elijah, according to this, was sleeping good. He didn't have no, he didn't have no problems. He was just sleeping away, and, and his servant got up early just... Maybe he got up early to make the coffee. <laughs> you know, I don't know why he was, or a fire, or whatever. He was sleep, Elijah was sleeping. This servant looks up, and he, he just starts turning around and going, Oh, my goodness. Those don't look like Israelites. All right? Let me use a word here, folks. He was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. He was young. Okay? His faith was probably young. All right? And I think it's cool that he was hanging out with a prophet, though. Folks, I, I want my kids and my grandkids hanging out with prophets, okay? Hanging out with people of God, people that love God, all right? And his servant said to him, Alas, my master. Notice the punctuation there. Folks, that means something in the Word of God. He was excited. He was scared. He thought, I'm going to die today. Because what's the odds? A great army, and again, I'm guessing great army was more than 650, was there, had the city surrounded. There was no way out. What shall we do? <laughs> I'll never forget this. This guy told me this joke about the Lone Ranger and Tonto. You probably know this, but I still think it's funny. They're surrounded by a bunch of Indians, and Lone Ranger says, what, he's gonna, what are we going to do? And, and Tonto says, I don't have no problem here. <laughs> All right? I mean, he was a Native American also. Just a joke, okay? I know it wasn't a good one. But I always think of that when I think, what are we going to do? Man, I'm fine. I don't have a problem with this. Okay? Elijah was not worried. Elijah did not fret. Okay? So he answered and said, I love this. Do not fear. Folks, how many times did Jesus in the Gospels tell his disciples not to fear? And you think about that. They were hanging around the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You would think of any body that should not fear after seeing what Jesus did, did, would not fear. But yet, in the storms, all right, they were afraid. Several times on the lakes, and in, in Galilee, on, on the lake, the Sea of Galilee, they were afraid. And here's my thing about that, folks. I'd rather be out in the water with Jesus than in the boat with the disciples that don't have a strong faith. And it says, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I'm pretty sure this young servant, probably in his late teens, had to process that. Okay, one, two, and I, I don't think he had to start counting to figure out the odds there, but he probably was scratching his head and saying, what is this guy talking about? He was panicked. He had fear, and by the way, folks, fear blinds us sometimes. It blinds us. We can't see God. We, we don't believe. We think we are going down. We are going down. And folks, I'm telling you, fear comes from Satan. All right? He tells us we have nothing to fear. Psalm 62. Go with me to Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verse 1. Truly, my soul silently silently waits for God. Okay? I'm telling you folks, uh, sometimes when the odds look bad, 
you know what God is doing? God is just making you wait. Teaching you patience. Letting you stew a little while and try to finagle your way out of it or figure a way out of it. Okay? And here's what I've learned over the years. God's timing is always right. It may not be what we want. It may not turn out the way we want it. But folks, we either believe Romans 8.28 or we don't. For all things work together for good. From Him comes my salvation. He only, I love that word, is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. What is is the psalmist saying? Don't sweat it. Okay? Don't sweat it. Don't worry. Folks, there are many a person that stay up half of the night worrying over situations. And you worrying and losing sleep is not helping the situation. Okay? Because when you're physically drained and tired, you don't make good decisions. All right? And Satan takes advantage of you. Folks, I am telling you, Satan plays dirty. He plays dirty. Verse 3, how long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. And we know... Uh, how easily those things are knocked over. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They are delight, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Folks, I'm telling you, that's Satan's job. The Bible says, uh, you know, uh, in, in uh, let's see, John 8, he's a liar. He's a liar. And we don't need to listen to his lies. That young man, I'm, he might have been trembling. And Satan had him thinking, man, I'm going to die today. I am going to die. There is no way out of this mess. Then verse 5, my soul waits silently for God alone. I hope you realize there are situations in life that only God can get you out of. Only God. All right? Only God. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. Oh, folks, if God is for us, who can be against us? Man, we we got the best defensive man in the world. In the world. I shall not be moved. Twice, he says, I shall not, I'm not moving, I'm not wavering. I'm not quivering, I'm not quitting, I'm not tucking tail and running, all right? I'm not begging for my life, I'm not going to do it. God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Here it is, trust Him at all times. Folks, that's easier said than done. Trust Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Three times the psalmist there says, God is our refuge. So when you're in a situation like this, folks, man, don't run from God. Don't run from God. Run towards God. He is your refuge. Now look at verse 17. We see the opposition. We see the odds. And the last thing we see here is the opening of eyes. And I'm telling you, I'm sure this young servant was, you know, when he first heard Elijah start praying, he was thinking, man, that wasn't exactly what I thought he should pray. All right? When you look at this first statement, and Elijah prayed, and by the way, there are some things that will only be solved through prayer. Folks, prayer is something I just really don't think we pray enough. I don't think we pray Uh, fervently enough. I don't think we pray in faith sometimes. We pray because we were taught, you know, when it comes down to the end and you're in trouble, just pray. Just start praying. Folks, my Bible says we should be in an attitude of prayer at all times. My Bible says we ought to pray about everything. So there's two keys in here about this situation. All right, One, it takes faith. And the second thing, it takes prayer. Remember when the apostles 
or the disciples, excuse me, were trying to cast a demon out of that young boy, and they couldn't do it. And Jesus says, oh, guys, guys, you've got to have faith. Okay, you've got to have faith. Some such as these cannot come out without prayer and fasting. And fasting, folks, is a discipline. So we have to have that discipline of praying and that discipline of believing. Okay, believing. All right, so we say, and Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray that he, oh, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. You know, he didn't pray for the enemy. He didn't pray first for the enemy. He prayed for this young servant. This is a teaching moment in this young man's life. You're worried about this, but I'm worried about this. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? You have to have faith. You have to believe. You have to give everything to the Lord. You have to pray as if it depended upon you, but knowing it depends on you on God. So he didn't pray, God, get me out of this. Or he didn't say, man, get us both out of here. And God could do that. He swept people away and they ended up somewhere else. But that's not what he prayed. He prayed that the eyes of this young man would be open. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. He saw. And again, folks, we're talking about spiritually. All right? First he saw the enemy. First he saw the soldiers. First he saw the numbers. And then God opened his eyes in faith by prayer and he saw a different picture. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What did God do? God sent angels, folks, angels to surround the enemy oh folks there's nothing more powerful than prayer and faith in god god can do anything god's divine protection was there and it says so when the syrians came down to him elijah prayed to the lord and said and again I believe Elijah was right with God. I believe Elijah was in tune with God. He prayed for the servant first, which what most people would not have done. And then he was open to God. The voice of God, that still small voice, told him, I got another prayer you need to pray right now. And Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elijah. What did he do? He did the impossible. Every one of those soldiers were struck blind. Could not see. And again, you know, there's been some say, well, they could kind of couldn't see. And, you know, I don't know the logistics of all that went on. All I know is the Bible says they could not see. And they literally had to be, we don't have time to go down through there and, and read the rest of it, but he, they, he literally led them, Elisha led them away from the Syrians. Have you ever thought about that? I, I, I didn't think about this till today. Why would he lead them? Why wouldn't he just take them back home and dump them there? All right? Folks, so what, what do you think would happen if that happened and Elijah was there and the king was there and realized that every one of them was blind? Elijah just walks off. Folks, they would have paid dearly. Those soldiers would have paid probably with their life. So Elijah, again, in tune with God, says, just take them to another place. Take them to a safe place. All right? And, and again, sometimes God chooses war, but I'm telling you, many times God chooses peace. And folks, the greatest peace we have is when we have the peace of God in our lives. No matter what is going on. Okay? See, Elijah, he didn't say strike them dead. Elijah could have prayed that prayer. But he said, just blind him so we can be protected. He was just doing what God told him to do. All right? That's what he was doing. Hebrews 11. And remember, two keys. 
two keys to seeing things spiritually is faith and prayer. Faith and prayer. Faith and prayer. All right, Hebrews 11. You know this, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If we can see it, folks, it's not faith. If we can see it, it's logic. If we can see it, and yes, we need to be logical. All right, It's not that God's illogical, but that spiritual world, so many people cannot see the spiritual world. They cannot see God's hand in this. They are blinded by fear. They are blinded by situations. They are blinded by sometimes themselves. All right? The unbelief blinds us. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. You will never be all God wants you to be without exercising faith in your life. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. He is what? He is our Savior. He is our refuge. He is our strength. All right? He is our rock. He is our salvation. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Folks, faith is the key. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, I know I've used a lot of psalm, but I just... I'm just uh, following what the Lord tells me to do. Psalm 27. I love this. You would almost think, you know, this, this is a direct line to what we read tonight, all right? The Lord is my light and my salvation. We were talking about being blind. Folks, I'm telling you, God gives us light. If you will walk with God, you will always have light. You have to think spiritually. Folks, even Christians can give you bad advice. Think spiritually, all right? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? I can answer that. Nobody and nothing, all right? Let me give you the answer to the quiz. And when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, that was exactly what Elijah was, where he was at. My enemies and Foes, they stumble and they fail. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. It's kind of like the, what I call the Oklahoma and Arkansas slang. I ain't scared. Man, I ain't scared. I'm not, folks. Death does not scare me. Okay? It really doesn't. My heart shall not fear. The war may rise up against me. This thing I will be confident. The one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me and he shall set me up on a high rock. Folks, that is our God. And then the last one, James 5, and I'm through. James 5, verse 13. Is there any among you suffering? Let him pray. Anyone cheerful, let him sing. Anyone sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let, uh, let them pray over him and anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We have done this in our church. And here it is, and the prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. Folks, that's why we still have a prayer time after our Bible study. We have seen people healed. We have seen the power of God. There is power in prayer. There is power in many praying. It says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Folks, it is prayer and faith. And folks, it's just like falling into the hands of God. I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care what's going on in your life. God can fix it. Okay? God can fix it and The main thing is to be sure when it happens, give 
God the glory. It is our God, folks. We serve a great, great big God. And sometimes the problem is not that we have, I mean, we have our eyes open, but we are seeing things physically, the concrete things of life, when we've got to open our eyes and look at the spiritual things of life. See it from God's point of view. Father, thank you for the night. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that uh, you're always there. God, I love stories like this. Man, Elisha was teaching this young man about what it is to have great faith. And God, I pray that we would be men and women of faith. God, I pray we would believe. And even when we can't see it, God, I pray that we would believe. So God, just uh, I, I think of the prayer list that we have. And God, I know you could answer uh, these prayers, and I know you have answered. And God, I just pray that we would never give up. And especially, God, I pray we will not fear. Uh, what can man do to us? God, you're there. You're our protector. You have our armor. Uh, Lord, you have our backs. So, God, I pray that as we uh, even leave this place tonight, we can just fall asleep with no fears, no worries, and just realize, man, I've got faith. I'm going to believe. And, God, I pray that we would have times of prayer. I'm talking good times of prayer talking about when we wake up in the middle of night. I do it all the time. I pray myself back to sleep. And God, I'm just, I just pray that we would just be men and women of faith praying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.